I see it from a full of junk. It's a room full of more expensive and interesting jobs. Chuck that maybe helps us learn about what goes to scrap in my school. Okay, yeah. I don't see anybody online unless they show up data, but we're going to get started. This <clears throat> yes, is, as you know, our monthly meeting. Uh, I think the notice went out too late for people to put their plans together for tonight, so that's what uh, where we are now. Nevertheless, <clears throat> Uh, the subject is very, very important in, uh, in terms of technical content. And uh, our speaker tonight is Nick, Nick <coughs> Christensen. And he's an environmental electromagnetic uh, engineer at SpaceX. And he studies the effect of uh, space charging on the spacecraft, which is a very hot topic in uh, all kinds of spacecraft, especially uh, Starlink with that many spacecraft that they put out. And uh, uh, if few of them break down as a result of discharge, then uh, then the whole system would be in jeopardy, right? Yes. So uh, with that, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome uh, Nick here to our meeting and uh, uh, ask him to start giving his talk. And if anybody shows up on the uh, on online, I'll monitor it. And if they have any questions, we will field the questions. Please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. Nick, would you like to question if you have asked any during the talk or one of the again? What do you prefer? Um, you guys can just shout out any questions as you have them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely okay with it. Um. I had given this originally uh, at a spacecraft charging conference. Um, so if if I happen to to gloss over a point um, and try and explain everything as succinctly and whatnot as I can, except yeah, if you guys would like clarification on anything, if it's a small enough group where I can so just okay, stop and, and yeah, we can talk about it. So All right, uh, I'm gonna pull this up. I think you might have to share the screen. Was it sharing the screen? It looks like it. It says I'm just screen sharing on the top. Yeah. Um, uh, are you guys, did you want me to record this? Is this recording already? It's recording. Okay. It's recording. Perfect. All right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll get right into it then. Um, yeah, so in this talk, uh, I'll be discussing some. Uh, spacecraft charging implications on Starlink and how we actually used some some arc data to create a map of the African anomaly, which is the main um, kind of plasma structure of the ionosphere. And yeah, like I said, just let me know if you guys have any questions while I'm going through this. Um, I'll start off with some background on not only Starlink, but um, spacecraft charging and the ionosphere, because uh, again, I know um, it, it's not the most common topic here. So after that, we'll get into how we actually ended up mapping um, the Appleton anomaly or the structure of the ionosphere. Um, I'll go into detail into how we detected these arcs, how I processed on this data, and then actually the, the maps themselves and the, the data that we got from it, more quantitative data versus just the pretty maps. Uh, I'll talk about how we verified that this map is what we think it is. Uh, like, yes, we were actually detecting arcs. Yes, the arc formed in a manner that we expected them to based on what we know about spacecraft charging physics. Um, so, yeah, this is on orbit data. This is ground testing. This is on orbit experimentation. It's, it's got a little bit of, of everything. But as I mentioned, to start with some background, on Starlink specifically. 
Starlink, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, is a lower orbit constellation of this point, well over 6,000 satellites, whose goal is to provide uh, global, low cost, high speed, low latency um, internet. So right now we're actually taking up over about 70% of, of active satellites, but a small portion of those, uh, 21, which is then filtered down to 15 uh, for data processing, uh, the focus of this talk. Those 15 satellites were part of Starlink Group 6-1, which was launched in late uh, February of last year. And they were the first launch of our new and it upgraded version two satellites. So if they were much larger, we could only fit uh, 21 of them initially. Uh, on a Falcon 9 launch, we could fit, I think, 56. We got up to 56 version one satellites uh, for Falcon. So they're a lot bigger, um, a lot more power hungry, and a lot more efficient, I'll say, um, except for maybe this first launch. Cool, then some background on the ionosphere. Again, this the ionosphere is just a, a layer of the atmosphere with the, the most ionized gas in it, or the most plasma. Um, it was actually first measured in the 1930s by this guy named E.B. Appleton. Uh, basically what he did was shoot some radio waves at the sky and measured where they bounced back to the earth and was able to create a, a very rough map of the, the Appleton anomaly that way. Nowadays, we're able to measure the structure of the ionosphere with the GPS scintillation measurements. So basically how um, a weakly ionized gas interferes with the phase and amplitude of GPS signals as it as it passes through. Um, so we call that two. Uh, so this is the critical frequency of the plasma in the F2 layer of the ionosphere. The F2 layer is just the most highly ionized layer of the ionosphere. Um, F O should be F sub O. I don't know why it's not. Um, but yeah, critical frequency right there. Um, we care about GPS a lot. It's critical for our everyday lives, obviously. Um, so it is imperative that we understand the bulk structure of the ionosphere to know how it sort of interacts with uh, our, our GPS data. So we have a very good idea of, of what the ionosphere looks like, but that's not necessarily the point of this talk. Um, I'll get into that later. But the, the temporal dependence of the uh, structure of the ionosphere is uh, generally driven by the, the solar cycle, the like local um, solar noon. So the sun actually creates the plasma in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, EUV, uh, extreme ultraviolet rays, uh, impacts the uh, kind of low density region of the atmosphere. Uh, they kind of excite an electron off of an atomic oxygen molecule uh, that plasma then sort of persists for some amount of time, uh, slowly kind of recombines as we shift into the night cycle. But uh, basically, long story short, uh, there is a high plasma density that follows local solar noon. Solar the, yeah, do you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the spatial dependence of the, the ionospheric structure is primarily governed by Earth's magnetic field. Um, so you have this, this plasma kind of being pulled by the, the movement of the Earth and being ionized by as local solar noon um, sort of moves above the Earth's surface in one frame of reference. Um, but then, so you have this E cross B drift that pushes this plasma upwards, uh, kind of lofts it up, and then uh, pressure and pressure gradients and gravitational forces sort of fattened down on either side of the local magnetic equator. Uh, I have this textbook diagram here. I have had pictures later on that have an animation that I can pull up if you guys want to better understand this. But yeah, basically E cross B here pushes plus up and then gravity and uh, you know, a high local pressure and kind of push it out to the sides. And you get these two plasma density peaks at around plus or minus 15 degrees latitude for all of that local. So the proposal of the electric 
Uh, it's called, yeah, it's called the local uh, ionospheric electrojet. Um, it's, it, it's it's lower, um, but yeah, there there have been plenty of papers <laughs> on it. Um, I'm not I'm not going to pretend I understand all of the, the the physics behind that, but yeah, it's basically caused by ionization at local solar noon and the rotation of the Earth and by kind of inter interactions with um, the Earth and dragging. That along with it. First time, you know, mm -hmm. There, there are some very cool graphics of, of this too. If you want to Google some some gifts uh, online as well. Um, the solar wind um, So most of the solar wind is like you know that's. Where you get the kind of higher energy radiation and whatnot, but um, a lot of that's shielded at these lower altitudes. So um, yes, like as you go farther from the Earth's surface and you're you have a weaker magnetic field, um, you do a, a worse job of shielding like the solar wind and some of these higher energy particles. Uh, but very few of them reach this altitude, and we're talking like a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface. Whereas you don't have a major in most places major radiation problem you don't have spacecraft charging issues due to the solar wind specifically the main factor that causes the ionospheric plasma is actually the so what, are the particular what is uh sorry what was that particular ions is it just oh yeah yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a quasi-neutral plasma. You have an atomic oxygen molecule and you rip an electron off of that. So you have ionized oxygen and electrons, and that's like ninety-nine point something percent of the, the gas composition, the, the ionized gas composition in the ionosphere. Um, the main point of this slide though is that you expect higher plasma density, you expect these peaks uh, kind of separated from the magnetic equator by about 50 degrees latitude. No. Yeah. I want to hear what the horizon is. Yeah, yeah. So if you're like right on the horizon, uh, it's not that all of the plasma just disappears completely. Mm -hmm. it, it drops uh, significantly, the density drops significantly, um, but that's because it takes a while. Like it's a sparse enough um, gas where you need to interact, you know, and then recombine uh, to get rid of this plasma, and that takes a while. So, yes, you have the peak around local solar noon, but as you go into the night side, you can have some of this plasma persist still, but it's just a lot less common. It's a lot less dense. All right, and then uh, last bit of background here with the first bit of data. Um, so background on, on spacecraft charging in, in low Earth orbit, it is generally fairly benign. Um, this plasma that I was just describing is, is very low energy. We're talking like less than 1 EV generally. It's fairly dense on the order of 1 E to the 13th uh, particles per cubic meter. Except it again at one EV, it's not not dangerous at all. The radiation you guys are probably used to dealing with are like in the order of N EV, so six order of magnitudes higher. Uh, spacecraft charging and like the Van Allen belts, you're typically concerned about ten to twenty five um, keV. So this very low energy, generally benign, uh, unless you have uh, a certain spacecraft design. Uh, where you can kind of self-induce some of these issues. So generally, again, this low energy plasma holds your spacecraft surfaces um, at about plasma ground. So zero volts, essentially, with respect to the surroundings. Uh, however, if you happen to have a high voltage ground referenced electrode, like let's just say you want to bias something to you know a few hundred volts with respect to your spacecraft chassis, um, you're actually going to collect a ton of electrons on that high voltage component. Um, 
spacecraft charging is essentially a current equalization uh, issue. So you collect electrons here, you need to collect ions somewhere else. So what happens is collect electrons here in order to try and produce or collect, sorry, um, more of these heavier ions, your chassis is pushed to negative, the positive ions are then attracted to that and kind of cancel out the electron current that you see on this uh, currently hypothetical high voltage electrode. Because of that, um, mainly these two factors here, uh, you get what's called an inverted potential gradient pretty quickly, where any of your surfaces, like your dielectric stickers, your thermal paints, whatnot, the surface of those um, are actually held at zero volts, as, as I mentioned here, within a few volts of plasma ground. The underlying chassis is pushed uh, negative, uh, yeah, to, you know, to the voltage that depends on whatever your, your salt induced electrodes are, or what they you know. So, Zero volts here, maybe 100 some volts here, you can discharge across them uh, fairly readily. And how readily is the subject of this paper? Um, so, on this graph right here, uh, you can see that we have collected uh, data on a significant number of arcs. Again, this is one e to the fifth um, per satellite uh, over the course of the year. And that's really around for that. Example. So each of these trend lines here are how many arcs we have collected over time. This red dashed line sort of sums them all up. Uh, so you can see we've, we've collected nearly um, a million arcs over the course of a year uh, on chassis of the spacecraft. And we did that with a uh, arc detector. So this arc detector was included on uh, communication subsystem on the Zenith side, so the top facing side of the spacecraft, um, in which a semi encapsulated sense electrode was soft tied to chassis ground, such that when you have this discharge, plasma current is collected on the sense electrode. Um, that charge is collected, causing the voltage spike, uh, spike as current slowly bleeds and reaches equilibrium with the chassis. Um, and then an arc is actually detected once that, that sense electro voltage um, surpasses a predefined threshold. So, how come we have to explain the fact that um, some of them they never know? Yeah. And some yeah. of them just keep going on yep. all the time. But... Yeah, yeah. So, that's one really interesting point about this data. Um, it looks fairly constant here, and then around the end of the year. Uh, we start to kind of uh, taper off. And that's actually because we had launched so many V2 satellites at that point, where we deprioritized bringing down telemetry from the older satellites. So it's not, we, we don't think it's that the arc rate actually kind of tapered off after a few months, half a year. It's that we just weren't recording that data. We have thousands of satellites, we have tons of data coming in, we just don't save it all. And this they're all duplicates of each other, right? They're all duplicates for, for the most part. Um, we obviously, at, at the start of this program, we made significant changes from launch one to launch two, fewer changes from two to three. Um, but in this single group, um, most of them were identical. In yeah. terms of the volume of collision yes. and the material, they're all yeah. the same. Yep. Yeah, uh, there are some exceptions, um, but that's what's going to say, but I filter some of those out of the data. If there's any changes, like experiments that we did on one satellite versus another that we think would affect this data specifically, we just threw it out. The detection is at a real time, or how, what is the speed um, that we can detect? You have to have a special algorithm to detect. Mm -hmm. What is the speed? Yeah, yeah. So we we pull down data. This is all post processing. But when we were looking at this in real time, you know, do an experiment and we get data process. Like it, it depends on our location with respect to the ground station, but generally within minutes. 
But I guess in the original agreement, you got a patch tag that goes oh. to the box, and we just get the cost. Oh, uh, yes, the arcs are time scanned as well. Is what actually? There, uh, we have time scans on the arc mm -hmm. as well. That's what you're asking. So, do so you see any difference with the like the atmosphere changes during the year? Right? Yep. Do you see any difference in the data from when you launch? Yeah, yeah. So, it's hard to say there again because of the inconsistence. Um, so, I'm sure you like downlinking. Uh, sometimes you just figure out some of this data, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, but we do see we do see some changes and I was like, we had a, a pretty massive solar storm here and I was trying to like see if we saw any more um, arcs then. And yeah, it, it, it's hard to say with the telemetry downlinking issue, um, but yeah, we, we can detect some, uh, I, I don't present on any of them, but I was able to find some interesting temporal changes that I could correlate with other events. I think it's kind of like back to the past ten questions. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a problem with this one, even though we can find one or the other tree, yeah, quickly and we lose the information. Yeah, okay, yeah. Because if you have a problem, they don't know the pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not that we ran out of like space in our buffer or anything, it's just that we sort of stopped caring as much about these satellites because we had launched hundreds more. Is there all version two satellites that was like detecting them? So uh, so like, nope. This this was only an issue or I guess a feature of the first group here. All right, so here's an animation of uh, where we're detecting these arcs. So you can sort of see an outline of our ground track here. So I have to come up and then you can see I'm coming down right around here. And you see around the equator, where the class of density should be higher, um, we see more arcs. So we get up to the top here, you don't see as many. Then as the ground, you know, as the, the satellite train sort of moves back through the equator, uh, we see more. Uh, it's kind of hard to interpret there. So I made a two dimensional histogram showing this, this raw arc data. And uh, this time it ended in two degrees. Uh, pixel and over uh, uh, a much larger time frame. You can see how fast a little more shift your time. So you can sort of see some structure here. It's sort of hard to tell, but uh, you can also see it sort of start to deteriorate, deteriorate, sorry, and get messier as we enter the new year. Um, but I also want to call out how we have these, yeah, right there. Uh, concentrations of the higher arc detection rates uh, at the extreme latitudes, these orbits. And as I will explain later, and I have a better image of this coming up too, um, we have to do some data processing to kind of filter out some of that odd behavior. I've mentioned this before, but we just removed all of these faulty satellites, things with weird experiments, things that were broken from this data set. Uh, and then we were able to start normalizing a lot of this data. Um, the biggest thing that we had to do is deal with this uh, byproduct of orbital mechanics that dis dictates that a disproportionate amount of time is spent at the extreme latitudes. So yeah, we need some spatial normalization to, to show true spatial correlations just because you spend more time um, at the extremes. And, and that's really illustrated by uh, this graph here. Um, so the raw arc data is shown right here in this dashed line. And again, you can see that we, we detect a ton more arc events um, at the extreme latitudes here. So dashed line, many arcs, many arcs, some stuff in the middle, um, which you know, sticks out more after you plot this normalization. But then we also took a, a normalization data set where we took essentially a random time sample of an equivalent number of data points and then said, like, this is what the bulk behavior of the constellation or as this group um, should look like. So this dotted black line is kind of, you know, if we were to truly arc 
and there was no dependence. There's no spatial dependence. It was just random throughout time. Like, what would we expect this distribution to look like? Um, and then if you divide those two, you can get rid of these extreme peaks at the latitudes, or extreme latitudes, um, and this double hump uh, of the altitude only really stays at the point. So this is all of our data. Um, it's compressed in longitude, and that's not very fun. So decompressing it, uh, you can see this spatial map right here of our uh, normalized arc rate from our arc area density. Uh, you can see that the you know, uh, higher arc rates are in yellow. So we have this band that follows the local uh, magnetic equator. And there is an elevated arc rate uh, around you know, plus or minus 25 degrees uh, magnetic inclination from that point. And that looks very similar to what we would expect the positive density to look like at this altitude and around the same time as well. So, this is the normalized on orbit data. Uh, this is an output of this uh, IRI model. It's basically a, a time average uh, iron sphere positive density software that I use to do a comparison of here. So visually, you take a step back and do look at these, and they follow very similar patterns here. All right. So you could sort of draw a conclusion from this that your normalized heart rate looks like what we would expect to the, the plasma density to look like. And the plasma density looks like this because maybe we'll know what I explained earlier about the opposite and how they mm -hmm. felt the effect and what not. And what is the breakdown voltage that all you have this Yeah, yeah. So it, it depends on the vocal plasma conditions. Like if you're in a very dense plasma, you can break down lower voltages. But I'll go over this in the ground, not ground testing section, but 55, 50, 70 ish volts. So you can have these breakdowns at a fairly low, low voltage. Yep. And what is the typical occurrence when it happens? So that depends on the voltage. There's a whole uh, field of study that like actually tries to predict these waveforms so we can test our ground hardware um, to something that uh, a waveform that looks more appropriate and it's representative of what we see on our But at, at 250 volts, um, I've done a bunch of modeling and I've tried to get like this worst case flashover. It leads to like a peak time of uh, you know, maybe 100 microseconds peak amplitude of uh, say between five and seven amps, depending on the um, assumption about what material is uh, you're kind of discharging through with like a full tail up to 500 microseconds. You see a difference based on the time of K, because I would think that when you're flying with the sun is. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely do. Um, that, that was one of the first things we observed about this, but yeah, uh, you, you essentially don't see arcs when it's at night time. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one, I can't really get into. Uh, two, yeah, there's just lower class density at night. But yeah, we saw zero arcs when satellites were not really good. So who developed this uh, no, this was done by an, an international collaboration. Um, so they basically take a bunch of um, like on orbit plasma measurements and, and whatnot, and then they feed in some geomagnetic indices and basically try and predict what the what plasma density will be at different times and locations. It's a free plasma. So they did a good job mirroring that. Cool. So yeah, you guys agree they look similar, um, but maybe not the most quantitative. 
So I, I then filtered this data set a little bit more to try and get like the highest quality data. Um, you know, you, I guess I want this out too. You can see there's maybe some of these ground tracks missing. Um, again, because we just deprioritize some of these. Uh, so you, it, it's not all like the cleanest data. So what I did, I basically filtered out this section uh, between 60 and 120 degrees longitude. Um, and I used that to compare uh, to this IRI model in a more quantitative way. So we were basically expecting the arc rate to have an approximately linear response to density. And you would expect that uh, based on the maps that I showed you. Um, but also physically, the incident ion flux uh, which is required to hold the outer portion of your dielectric surface at zero volts to get that gradient across it, which then breaks down. Um, the incident ion flux uh, is, it goes linear with density. Um, the steady state charging rate, like how fast you can actually achieve this differential, is also linear in density. So we would expect these results. Um, I plotted the output of the IRI model on top of the uh, normalized arc area density. So black line model, red line on orbit data, um, they're right on top of each other. Uh, here, I plotted them against each other. And you can see, yes, with my nice red line the best fit, that it is indeed linear, as we expect. Again, I filtered it to like the highest quality data set here or a portion of the data that I have, but yeah, right, right up with each other here. Um, so pretty strong correlation. Uh, I'm going to get into some of the experimentation. Uh, do you guys understand this? Do you have any questions that I can answer right away? Cool. So to verify what we were actually detecting in arcs and not something else, um, we first did some ground testing. Um, uh, so fairly ground testing, I'll say, um, where we basically put a starling thruster hollow cathode in a vacuum chamber. Uh, we threw it in one of these uh, full-scale arc detector uh, circuits. And then we biased that whole thing to the expected voltage to get that inverted potential gradient um, the differential across your surface coatings um, that I was talking about earlier. And uh, we basically watched it break down. So then plasma well, storage right here, putting ions, positive charge uh, on the top surface, holding it at about zero volts. Um, the chassis here, the metallic structure is then biased negative uh, with respect to the plasma. So you have a differential across this surface code. That breaks down is detected by the arc detector. Um, and yeah, we basically verified that that happens and we can detect these sparks. Uh, we have a discharge, um, we break down that, that biological layer, and we, we verify that we, we have triggered our collective. We first saw breakdowns. Um, at approximately 50 volts. Um, we actually didn't trigger the arc detector until 75 volts. So we're basically missing some of the arcs. If we can arc against those 50 volts, we can't detect them until 75. Then the data set that we have gathered on orbit is only a subset of all of the arcs that we would like to see. Um, and it's also worth noting that, again, like this is a 4 amp discharge here. Uh, at 75 volts, it, it's pretty hard to get four amps. Like that's that's a pretty big discharge. So um, this is definitely a conservative test. So coding, is there any potential? How are, are we measuring the potential wear? Well, because the 50 volts, I mean, there's a differential potential between the damage and the chassis. Yeah. So can you... I guess I'm kind of unclear how to measure the potential how the altitude for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, two things. Uh, first, the plasma source is grounded, so the plasma should be ground referenced. Um, second thing is when we actually. Well, the cathode will be totally negative. 
Yeah, yeah, it can float. Yeah, you're exactly right. It can float by then when you can see between 20 and 30 on Reddit. Um, but yeah, the, the just because you ground, um, you know, the negative sign or hollow cap that doesn't mean that the plasma potential is zero volts. Uh, so how we actually measure that is we have a diff curve um, across the the bias voltage and around, and we can see how much of it discharges. Right. So if our arc, you see it go from right. negative, you know, 50 volts to zero volts, when you set your supply to 75 volts, then you're actually seeing that the uh, um, either an incomplete discharge or an improperly referenced plasma. Does that make sense? Yeah, you are, yeah. We also have probes now. We can do this experiment that we can expose the surface to a plasma. It's a non contact voltmeter essentially that we put over the surface and we can measure the potential of that. And we verify that it does indeed get to what we expect it to. And how do you, uh, I guess, I would think that your power supplies are going to be trying to compensate for this too. Yeah. So I'm wondering how much of that. You're able to actually see because you know the power supply is starting yeah. to so try to short it out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no, that's that's a very good point. I didn't mention that we have this isolation resistor right here on the order of like uh you know from 30 to we don't go higher than 100 kilo ohms. Um, so that basically uh removes we're mostly worried about the capital capacities of the power supply. And it, it, you know, a few hundred microseconds is generally too fast for the supply to respond. Okay. But the health capacity is discharging. So we have this uh, isolation resistor here to basically damp out all of the health capacities. It means that this chassis will trickle charge. And then once it discharges, you're only discharging this capacity. And we shape this capacitor resistor and inductor such that it matches this nice smooth waveform. Uh, from models that we developed to better match what we have. Does that mean the power supply start clamping uh, much higher frequencies than any of the other business? Uh, we, <laughs> um, yeah, we we can do this testing up to like uh, ten kilovolts now. Um, and those supplies generally respond a lot slower. So I'm not, not too worried about it in that sense. But there are some some issues, like if you're powering your test article, you want a very fast response supply. So if this uh, like diagnostic breakdown shorts uh, two power electrodes together, you could have sustained arc. And we want power supplies on the other side that can feed that sustained arc in a manner that's similar to how battery would or your power system locks out. So yeah, we we want this slow supply sometimes in a day fast supply others. All right. Um, and then moving on to some on orbit experimentation. Um, I mentioned before that you need some ion flux to kind of hold the surface of your dielectric at you know ground to zero volts. Um, you can't do that without without ions. Uh, the interesting thing about the plasma in lower orbit is that it's so low energy that your heavy ions are actually moving slower. Their thermal velocity is slower than the velocity of the spacecraft moving through them. So essentially, the ions are direction. Your spacecraft is moving this way, and your ions is like basically static compared to it. So the relative ion flux. Is only going in, or I guess, opposite to uh, the velocity vector of your spacecraft. Uh, our detector is on the, the zenith side of the satellite. Um, so that's normal orientation right here. Uh, however, we were able to experiment, like, uh, modify the pitch of the spacecraft such that the arc detector was completely uh, shattered. You know, it's in the it's in the ion wing or the void where all of your ions are inching on this surface opposite to the arc detector. 
and you essentially uh, don't get that gradient across surfaces on um, the side of the carbon detectors on, so you don't see as many break bands. And that was the theory, I guess, and we confirmed that. Uh, so we ran a disorientation here uh, for eight hours total and detected zero works. And then we looked at uh, eight hour windows, uh, you know, plus or minus a few days from when we did this experiment. Um, we thought no eight hour window was that observed fewer than five. So going from this, this configuration to zero, this configuration is, is a significant result that shows us that the ion flux uh, dependence is, is very real. You can't have this converted potential gradient, which then breaks down if you don't have ion flux incident around your large detection. So it's not that parts weren't happening in this other orientation, it's just that we didn't detect them because they were falling apart architecture. Uh, questions on that? Got one more experiment to kind of seal the deal then. Um, and in this experiment, uh, we ran our thruster in, in plasma contactor mode. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with like, the plasma contactor on the ISS, um, but they were worried about a very similar problem happening on uh, space station. Uh, so what they did is install this plasma contactor that would essentially act as a bridge between uh, the, the, the space station and the, the local plasma environment by like it just basically emitting plasma from a hollow cathode um, continuously. They determined that they didn't need it, but uh, it, you basically bleed excess charge that forces your chassis negative um, and you, you reach equilibrium with the environment. So we ran our satellite thruster um, just a hollow cathode um, in, in this contactor mode for over three orbits. One is shown in the graphic here. Um, while we were running in contactor mode, we measured what we essentially uh, determined to be the, the neutralization current. So how much extra charge was being shed on the thruster to the space environment. Um, again, our chassis is expecting to be negative. Uh, so more current here uh, means that we essentially are collecting ions um, from a plasma environment uh, to kind of equalize the spacecraft chassis with the environment. Um, and you can see here that this correlates fairly well with, again, the uh, local plasma density as determined by or predicted by the higher run model that I used before. So as we go into the first peak, of the altitude and on lane, we have a higher plasma density, and our thruster has to work harder to keep our chassis neutral. And that's what we're seeing the spike in current here. And then again, currents, or sorry, plasma density spikes again, and our neutralization current spikes as well. Um, so this tells us that yes, the chassis was was also biased. So that that is like the second half of this inverted potential grade. Uh, sorry, what was that? So you're like, how do you how do you make the measurements? How do we make these measurements? Um, so we we telemeter the current that is, uh, you know, going into and out of our hollow cathode, and then we also measure current on the chassis. So we we can basically, um, do some fun math with all of our current sensors. The current on the chassis is coming from where? What is that coming? Is there like some exposed plasma? Is there like a probe, probe? No, no, no extra probes here. This is just a mismatch between current in and out of the hollow capping supply. So they're different. Like normally, you know, you have you have this discharge, and um, it, it I think better to, to explain it um, without so, yeah, like, giving too much. Well, because yeah, I understand what you're trying to go with. So yeah. The big purpose has to be to yeah. get the current somehow of the yeah. energy plasma actually reaching your mm -hmm. chest. Because, yeah, you're trying to figure out like, how much current is the flow from the cathode 
Yeah. 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 Essentially, we do a bunch of. We have enough um, current sensors on our thruster where we know we keep track of where almost all of the current is going. So current here plus current here minus current here, depending on the direction of our sensor or our shunt, um, you know, should sum to zero. When it doesn't sum to zero, we know that that charge is being shed or given to us, like from the local environment. I mean, so you do have some current sensors. We we have current sensors, it's but only on our thruster. Only on our thruster. Yeah. Sorry, it's It's yeah. It's an answer in answer language. It's yeah, yeah. So we're. It's like when you hold a power supply at a specific voltage and you measure how much current it takes to hold that voltage, right? That, that's essentially what we're measuring, but instead of like a power supply outlet to some electrode, oh, a power supply to plasma. But they'll give you a discharge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when, in this moment, are you even running the power supply anymore? Or they're just running the hollow cap? Just, just the hollow cap. So you don't even have a discharge. Well, it's a discharge current mm -hmm. and plasma. Yeah, so well, the... you, can, you can run a hollow cap node on its own. I don't know. I'm saying that like there's no discharge current propagation. Mm -hmm. There's no discharge unless you're measuring the end of the bottom. You said that you, you don't have to do that rust on it. You're going to have to do that. So, you know, the, the cathode is your free source of electrons to start a thruster, which actually provides the thrust through the anode. But when you just have like your keeper running, you can still measure current loss to the environment. With but are you running the thrust are you going for the keeper? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So through, we're, we're throwing for, we're flowing propellant through the keeper. Like that's the keeper. Yeah. But not the main thruster. Not the main thruster. The main thruster. Yeah. So the so you measure the discharge current mm -hmm. of the main thruster. Of the keeper. In the keeper. Angle. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is just based on the keeper current. Keep, keeper current alone. Just the hollow cathode flowing propellant through it. We have a discharge, but there's like there's well, current I mean, missing somewhere. I guess if you had um, if you are at all, if you run the potential drop to the other the cathode, then you actually will collect this current into there. Mm -hmm. You need some kind of some ionized plasma mm -hmm. So it could be interesting for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah no, good, good question. And yeah, uh, we can talk more about it. Yeah, yeah, how we actually measure that. Yeah, it, it required some clever uh, thinking from our uh, propulsion engineers to, to figure this out. And uh, one of, it was Ryan uh, who you met in, in France before. Cool, yeah, so through these last three experiments, uh, ground testing told us that yes, we were actually uh, measuring arcs. We saw an arc on the chassis. We measured an increment in our arc cancer. Um, the orientation experiment verified one half of the inverted potential gradient theory, where you need ions to hold top surface at you know, the zero volts, essentially. And then the contactor experiment proved that we have a chassis that is floating negative, um, kind of giving us the other half of this inverted potential gradient. So again, Dielectric surface, positive, underlying chassis, negative. You break down there, and we verify that like all three components of, of that um, expected procedure uh, are, are accounted for and, and present on these satellites. Um, then working our way back, kind of closer to the front of, of this presentation. Um, this is by far the largest collection of armored park data that. I know of a lot of other satellites, like uh, you know uh, some of the uh, DMSP, the Preha satellites, like Preha satellite. Um, they give you arc data. They give you, you know when we were uh, when we measured some of these discharges, when we had some high level spacecraft charging. Uh, but almost a million arcs is is pretty unheard of here. Um, and we were actually able to use this to do something interesting. We measured the structure of the ionosphere indirectly through these chassis arcs. Um, 
So that's interesting itself, but it also kind of leads you to um, some interesting conclusions about like using a large uh, low Earth orbit satellite constellation to gather uh, a lot of, of data um, in real time in ways that maybe you couldn't do with just like a single dedicated satellite. And, and that's how most of these spacecraft charging experiments and, and a lot of uh, other spacecraft missions work. You have a single satellite, you have a very high quality sensor on it, and you get high quality but sparse data. Um, whereas when you have you know, 15 or you know, maybe even thousands of, of satellites in orbit, uh, you, can, you can do very interesting data and the data you get is potentially useful in an interesting way, even when your sensor is as low fidelity as, as our arc detector uh, was here. So still get interesting data there. So this information doesn't necessarily flow into like how you communicate with the uh, ground station, right? <laughs> Um, it is, it, it can provide some disruptions to our communications, um, but it, it, it didn't really change much about how we communicate, like any of the, the base structure. We essentially got rid of the arcs in our next mission and, and we're able to resume normal operation after that, but it, it didn't, um, require any revelations on or major revisions on how we communicate with ground stations. I, I'm not sure if that's what you were specifically asking. Yeah, I was just wondering if you're trying to use the in a real time way to, you know, mm -hmm. and I got, I'm not sure if you guys are flying beams or that sort of thing. So oh, um, yeah, it'd be, um, it, it did cause some like system faults. Uh, that interrupted our um, nominal operation, except it it was just it was more like the, the high level system itself, and not like anything related to, to beam forming or anything like that. I was I was thinking in terms of the spacecraft as well as the model the equipment and safety. Mm -hmm. An operation has this study uh, show what would be the threshold for instance for the uh, safety of the spacecraft on the arc? Uh, arcs can be tolerated before things break down. Yeah. Um, from the performance of the electronic the scale. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't say much on that, uh, but it's worth noting that. Here, uh, there are 21 satellites launched um, in this group G61, and there are 15 satellites used in this study. That, yeah, I, I don't know if I can say it. You, you can look for news articles um, around this date. Um, but yeah, I would certainly not recommend um, arcing hundreds of thousands of times on your spacecraft, I would strongly recommend. Are there efforts to kind of build a mitigation techniques in, within the satellite itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we mitigated this on the next flight. Um, so yeah, it's, there are, it, it, it's, it's not too hard to kind of, Add in some of these extra protections um, to you know your power system, your solar, a, any of these other high voltage electronics um, on your spacecraft. Um, it can just be a matter of like that. Um, the arrays themselves are about like twelve to thirteen meters long. Um, the body of the space and there are two arrays, um, and the body of the spacecraft is about. I want to say like two and a half by three meters, but it's a pretty flat panel. Maybe total thickness is uh, uh, six to eight inches. Thicker and solid for sure. So in the uh, 
if they start putting in litigation in that premises, I mean, like I would expect, basically like a search suppressor, right? Um, and now you're controlling that spacecraft voltage, you know, very carefully. You know, you pretty much filter the stuff out pretty quickly, I would say. Well, yeah, well, the, the, the mitigation, like in, in this case, I gave an example of, you know, how you could have this happen. Um, you know, there, there are two things that are required. One is your, your chassis has to go negative. And to do that in lower orbit, you need exposed high voltage ground reference like cell systems, somewhere in there. Um, you need that to collect electrons to drive your chassis negative. Um, and then you also need uh, non conductive surface coatings, like your uh, non ESP thermal paint or like FET caps on stickers, whatever. Um, like, your, your chassis surface. Uh, if either one of one of those do not exist, then you don't have this problem. And, and you don't have this integrity and you don't park. So it, it's not um, the easiest thing to do is not to make your subsystems robust to arcing. It's to remove the arcs in the first place here. Um, but I would say that for instance with your antennas and stuff, you may not be able to talk here, but I uh heard that you can not. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be a very good antenna. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that would be like a potential, like, hey, let's make our subsystems very robust to this instead of just remove the thing that causes the issue in the first place. So, I don't know if you can speak of it, but you guys have been in the environment that's been before. Yeah, we, we've done that. Um, I haven't been able to do art testing on a full set because uh, that involves a. I, I want to, um, but when you have a battery in a vacuum chamber and you make it arc. Uh, I'm just curious, because so, the missing set of satellites in this case, I think that's something we tested, but it would indicate some issue. Yep. Right on. That's why I have a lab now. <laughs> Especially not with the cheap guy. Yeah, middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's more starting stuff. Uh, we solved the problem. They're not going to make the same mistake again. Uh, and yeah, the biggest issue for space track charging for Starship, which See what you're referencing, Texas, uh, based on our new HQ there, uh, is HLS. We're going to fly through the Ben Allen belts. There we have, you know, we interact with these 25, 20 kilovolt electrons that can cause the same thing. Uh, the same thing being service discharges, but with an entirely different mechanism behind them. They're not self induced, they are just brought about by the high energy uh, parts of something. Uh, so we're all our way to the Yeah. If you get more questions, I guess you can see. Nary's uh, grilling you pretty hard there, too. <laughs> what does this cause the uh, produced ozone? Because they have a chemical oh. interaction between the compound and the air surrounding. How do you? <laughs> I actually, they, they may provide a, a tiny bit of like whatever coating is being broken down. Um, at least these these small surface discharges here, uh, like so much so that when you do this in a vacuum chamber, you have an arc, you see no change in your pressure gauges. Um, I haven't put like a, a mass spec or anything in a chamber while doing this. I don't know what the byproducts look like, but. Um, you know, like a lot of white thermal paint is, is zinc oxide. Um, you know, that's like the, the pigment that makes it so white to these the thermal folks. So they have to deal with their um, emissivity and whatnot. Um, so I'm assuming and a lot of the the arc flashover models that I've been referencing to get that way for uh, they they essentially assume that the plasma that is generated is the atomic constituents of whatever surface is being vaporized. So you have the zinc oxide paint. Uh, you know, you maybe have some 
uh, some more carbon in there, but like you essentially have a class of zinc, oxygen, and carbon uh, in in their like uh, monotonic form. Uh, it, it doesn't account for any like secondary molecules that can fell form or anything like that. So I, I don't know. Uh, long way of saying that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we essentially use a simplified model to produce what these waveforms would be, and I haven't been done with this. Do, do they like the criteria commentary all the time, or do they tell you, "Sorry, I think you we're selling this to the paying customers"? Uh, <laughs> we I don't think we have I don't know if we have anyone that actually buys our telemetry uh, data like this from us. Um, I could be wrong there, but. We essentially generate so much data. I, I forget the number, but with thousands of these satellites and um, you know all of the different telemetry channels that we have, like, we just can't store it all. Um, like our alerts alone, I think we're piling up to like hundreds of gigabytes a day, and that's just like text. Um, you know, you, you have uh, something weird going on here. Uh, not not to mention like the data stream you know, being collected at ten or hundred hertz or even. Killer it's for like our laser systems. So we just don't have the bandwidth to store all of those. I'm sure if I asked them uh, at the time to you know keep monitoring uh, you know the, the art detector channel on these sets, like they maybe could, but it, it's hard to monitor that. Well, I guess you probably prefer the you know, versions of the QMRs. You know, yes. So, yes, we yeah, we confirm that. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, Mr. Mango and the speaker. Yeah. Here, you guys uh, reach out. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm going to this meeting of the phone is recorded and posted on our website for those who, for Whatever reason we don't attend, they can watch it. And uh, of course, contact me both ways. Nick was there too. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoy it. Um, we have lots of kids on here. Please say something. Please say something. We have no time to get to the yeah, I was late with getting 